Okay. Welcome to the Decolonizing Education YouTube channel. Um, in this episode, we're going to be talking to Alex and Marsha around what it means to decolonize our practices around partnership. Marsha, Alex, can you just quickly just introduce yourselves and what you do within your role, and then we'll have the conversation. Okay, my name is Marsha Garrett. I run a charity in the northeast of England and I work with predominantly young people from African Caribbean backgrounds. I also work with parents as well. And we're doing a small project where we're trying to introduce more black history into our local schools. Mm. Okay. Well, um, I'm Alex Mason. I'm, well, I just finished my PhD at the University of Sheffield um, looking at race, higher education um, and literature. And currently I'm working in the Arts and Humanities Knowledge Exchange team, so focusing on partnerships between university and local organisations, community organisers um, within sort of the local Sheffield area. Mm. So let's start right at the beginning in terms of looking at the core of the issue, which is communities. What do you think is missing currently at the moment within education around community knowledges? I think um, if I could just say, um, I'm going to base it on some work that we did recently. So one of the things that I do is I speak to my young people about their experiences in secondary school. So I, I'm not really working with a great deal of university aged young people. Um, and I ask them basically what they're being taught, how they feel that um, education works for them as, as black young people. And one of the things that comes round consistently, they don't use this term, but this is how I've processed the information, is that there's a process of inferiorization still within our education system. So, um, so to give an example, one young man said that when they were covering the transatlantic slave trade, he just felt shame and embarrassment, the entire whole of that section. Um, and he said, therefore, he didn't want to engage in the lesson. And that because of the way that the information was delivered, that other pupils then saw him as less than and asked him if you know you are descended from slaves so that there is still this really big thing of black history doesn't start with slavery i know it's been said before mm -hmm. um but it continues to have impact um then one of the other things that we did is so we worked with the young people and we de devised a number of packages that we could go into schools and deliver but we also then asked parents about their understanding experiences of their children yeah one of the issues that came up is that Pair, when when young people experienced racism, and that doesn't have to be blatant as, as we know, it can be mm -hmm. structural. Um, so experienced racism, whether it be a teacher consistently calling them out for their behavior as opposed to other students, mm -hmm. the parents didn't feel that they had the, I suppose, the power to be able to go in and challenge the school. So what they were then doing is telling their child, work harder, keep your head down, stay out of trouble, which was then having a negative impact in the in the home. So it was a much wider sort of ripple effect than just on that student. Mm. And I think that's that's for me, that's a reoccurring theme in a lot of the work that I do in communities where they don't know what to question and they don't know how to question it because those the structures and the power imbalance is just so ingrained. And there's this, there's this expectation that the school is the fountain of all knowledge and therefore what they're delivering to our young people is correct yeah. and it's sufficient and we're not, we're not well positioned to challenge it as parents, as carers, as community members. Alex, what are your thoughts on that before we have a think about the role of ed education within community centres themselves? Yeah, I mean, actually, the last bit you were talking about was kind of what I was going to say is that I'm obviously more in the university and, and my sense is that there's a real lack of, um, there's a lack of transparency. And it, a recent event that we did together that was made quite clear, um, people have a sense that the university could be a helpful thing to engage with, um, but there's no um, communication coming from the university really, um, which sort of explains how the structures sort of operate um, weighs in. So many people I've been meeting with recently, mostly artists who want to work with the university for various reasons, never know how to actually get into the university. Um, I just think of like the, 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 the sort of optics of like Hallam on one side, the University of Sheffield on the other side. It feels like these two looming presences, like they're so like 
part of like the city center and yet there's a real like um opacity like there's there's a blocking off of um and so people actually of of the community don't actually get to understand how those structures work but they're always made to feel i think that looming kind of presence um yeah. and, and talking about that infer inferiority element i know that that's true as well when there are moments of engagement all of those feelings because of how the university has positioned itself as being this authority or knowledge and and, and like the, the bastion of, of all intellect mm -hmm. that when there is those moments of engagement those feelings mean that there isn't proper engagement and actually it can be quite a bad experience that's not replicated again um, yeah. so i so i suppose i think a bit more from the university angle in terms of there needs to be more transparency but i guess we can we can talk about that yeah. in a bit. And I think a lot of the times when we talk about partnership working, we th we think about it within the context of universities. We don't think about partnership working within the context of schools. And if you look at decolonizing education, our conversations around decolonizing education are always around what can we do to decolonize the pipeline? Because it doesn't start at university. You have yeah. to start all the way at school. And yeah. if we're saying, OK, one of the ways in which we're going to do that in higher education is think about how we can bring in community knowledges and start doing partnership working. Those conversations really should be happening right at the beginning within schools as well. So I'm, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think there's, there's a reason why there's less community partnership working even happening within a school, con within the school part of education? Goodness, that's... I think, um, boy, goodness, I'll be really honest. So we have delivered in some local secondary schools and we've also done training with staff around structural racism. So the reality of structural racism, how their actions and behaviours can reproduce racial inequality. Mm -hmm. And there is still, disappointingly to say, this total thing of denial. So I, I think what it is, it's partly that people are, are very frightened of being branded the racist. So, yeah. so that already kind of puts a bit of a block in the, in the discussion. Um, but the, the other thing as well is, is the fact that the schools have the power to say who enters, who they connect with. Um, so you need what we've been trying to do actually is building up some support from local MPs so getting them so we sort of so we kind of need to be legitimized to get into the schools yeah. and that can be a massive uh, a massive barrier and i would assume it's like potentially a bit similar with universities it's mm. of, 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 no it's like who you know and and being able to get in and then still deliver the truth <laughs> yeah yeah well i yeah. mean like the, the university obviously do a lot of outreach um within secondary schools especially and colleges um, and I know I've been part of programs that we've tried to do, like a, a Black History Month outreach thing and various other, I suppose, workshops and events that touch on Black history and other elements of, um, I don't know, histories that are not being taught in the current curriculum that should be. Mm -hmm. um, and we had an, um, a circumstance where on the very day we were supposed to have this quite big event, two schools didn't show up um, at all and they hadn't let us know. And Basically, the reason why was because getting the permissions to leave um, the school were really hard. And also with the demands of like the, the curriculum that they have, getting any, enough people on board to take the students out of that like, core classroom and take them to anything that ex that's extracurricular is it, too much of an ask for a lot of people. And, and that was the feedback we kept on getting. Um, and so people were, they were committing, but as soon as it came down to it, there were various things that happened structurally that meant yeah. that they couldn't actually take part. Um, and it's part of my frustration with uni as well. I think the same thing happens again. There should be more flexibility, but when push comes to shove, um, there seems to be a, not enough capacity for people to like do the extracurricular stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's, so to my mind, it's always been, well, how does the extracurricular then become? It, it can't be extracurricular because it's not going to work as well. Yeah, so exactly. It, which is obviously, I mean, you know, that's then the whole question of how do we make change from inside that, that classroom in, in terms of the core modules. Um, mm. But yeah, so I yeah. think it's, a top to, it's, it's, it's along the whole sort of spectrum, I think, that issue. Mm. 
And I think that's the real worry about partnership working, that it's seen as an add-on and it's seen as something that's supplementary and it's seen as, okay, we need to have a bit of extra knowledge in this particular area. Who can we bring in? Yeah. And it still places the the canon of knowledge that universities or schools prioritise as being the core and everything else being a little bit extra that we can add on to. So, Alex, you and I have had conversations several times about um, communities and the knowledges that are held within communities. Um, Marsha, what are your thoughts on... So I, I, have a, I have a consideration for both of you. Have a think about this. Do you think communities actually need to work with schools to decolonize the curriculum? Or do you think we need to go back to a place where we have things like Saturday schools and the responsibility of the knowledge around our history and heritage needs to be reclaimed and owned by communities again? Because this is an ongoing debate about whether or not we need to invest all of our energy into just decolonizing the curriculum or whether or not we should also recognize that it's there's there is education that needs to be decolonized within the school space but there's also education that exists within communities and rather than trying to bring that just into the school space we need to value what we have and what we own and legitimize it for ourselves does that make sense Mm -hmm. What what are your thoughts on that you know, I, I think it would be both. <laughs> it would be mm, both for me. I agree. Um, so, as you were saying about add-ons, I, the mm. consistency within schools. So, if we go and deliver something once a year in October, that what is the really the wider impact? It it can have impact on some individual pupils, but the wider impact in terms of on the school and on the staff and on their processes and how they they run is is minimal. Um, mm. I feel that we have greater, because I, I do run a Saturday school, and I feel that we have greater impact within that. So um, when my young people come and we'll, we'll pick a particular person, for example, so I do spend a lot of time on Haiti. I just, for me, Haiti really should be in the yeah. curriculum. It's huge to Absolutely. not have Haiti in the curriculum. Um, so we, I spent a lot of time um, working on Haiti and the benefit from it is that when they were going back into school and certain things were being said, like the slaves, they were then correcting teachers and saying mm. it should be enslaved or people forced into slavery. They weren't automatically slaves on account of being black. Um, so, so there is impact from that. So for me, yeah. it, it would be it would be both. And there is yeah. there is an absolute value to delivering within the community as a you know as a community member, and then working with um, the different cultures um that that mm. people um of, Af- of african descent come from so mm. that there is real but yeah it would be both I, I do want to see it in the curriculum because there's so much misinformation Absolutely. given out um, and if they're not accessing a saturday school that's what they're going to take forward mm. um so it, it does need to be both in yeah. my opinion. i yeah. agree i agree I, I think so i think it would be um it, it would be a dangerous thing to sort of just leave the formal schools and, and universities to do their own thing to some extent and focus oh entirely on Saturday schools because you know obviously when I think of a Saturday school my, my thing is about educating people of colour about a history that they're not getting taught about but of course if you've got all the white students going to the formal school formal university yeah. and they're taking in that education of um, British history which um, we, we know uh, to be inaccurate then they're still going to grow up thinking a certain way accessing positions yeah. of power um, utilizing sort of the knowledge that they've got from school so we we definitely need to be focusing on that but I am certainly increasingly thinking of putting my energy into work around Saturday schools and alternative sort of spaces for teaching because I I suppose it comes as a part of frustration of constantly like hitting a barrier Um, I I think I find an opportunity within the uni to like do something a bit more alternative and something else comes up that gets in the way and dilutes it and stuff yeah, And I just wonder, I think this is a particular issue of uni as well, is who's doing the teaching. Yes. Um, you know, in my, in my department, the English department, like, there's, I've never been taught by um, an academic of colour. Uh, mm. And I've been in the same uni for eight years. Um, and to me, that really then um, affects how the knowledge is being taught, probably what's being focused on in the lesson and stuff, and how that classroom culture is being negotiated. Um, a Saturday school se- sort of seems to me as if you could sort of you can get people who are of the history teaching the history 
they can create a classroom culture that's much more inclusive and have much more control on the content. Yeah. So I really want to sort of explore that more um, yeah. myself personally. I, yeah. and, in, and in terms of partnership working, is there potential then for schools and for universities rather than collaborating with individuals to actually collaborate and with Saturday schools? And what would that look like in terms of a partnership? Because again, I'm, I'm just re remembering the, the point that you made earlier around power. Yeah. Uh, and and there is a there is a there's an element of sacredness to Saturday schools, yeah. particularly for communities. And then bringing universities or bringing schools in and saying, can we create meaningful partnerships so that the things that you're delivering are in line with a, a portrayal of history that is accurate and that is authentic, but at the same time protecting that space so that it isn't taken over by institutions like schools and like universities. So how does, can partnership working in that particular kind of way work out? I, I think for me, potentially, yes. Okay. Um, what you're saying about the space is really important. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing this work for a number of years and I've, I've developed my skills and my confidence going, well, I, I can go into a school and deliver um, information that people may not have heard of before and may feel instantly sort of defensive about and, and be able to negotiate that space. I couldn't say that everybody that I have the pleasure of working with is at that stage and that's no disrespect to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they could easily be intimidated that you would just lose what you were trying to do. I think one what, what we're doing at the moment is we've just received funding at this time, so nothing's going to happen for a while, but we've just received funding to do up a building that we have. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we consistently speak about as a staff team is about people coming into our space to reduce that level of intimidation and to change with regards to the power structure. So I think it could be, it could be done in small doses if you will so say for example you um so instead of the staff training day taking place in the school they come into our space with our community members um look at what we've been teaching ask questions and um, and see where it could go from there and then even potential for doing that with pupils as well you know in small groups to yeah. come into our space and and again just change that dynamic so i think it could work yes mm. it could work but it, it would be a very slow process it would it definitely wouldn't be anything quick yeah what would where would the accountability be in that kind of process so if the university or if the school were to do their teacher development days for example within a community space how can you follow up to ensure that the things that they take on board are going to be meaningfully implemented yeah. but also the community is going to get something for their time yeah. rather than just going into those community spaces and sharing their knowledges but when those individuals actually leave because again there's that power imbalance there's the idea of going into community spaces and just taking knowledge what could be offered in return so that it is a meaningful partnership rather than an exchange that just seems unequal yeah that's the next that's such an excellent point because um it, it for me it comes back down to that whole consistency thing so if 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 in October, I'm using October because of Black History Month, if in yeah. October we got every school coming to us, I, I, then I, I pretty much know what the, the reason is that mm. it's to tick a box as, as such, <sighs> to make it meaningful. I, you know, I don't like the idea of charters, you know, these kind of race equality charters, race equality plans. I, mm. I don't like them um, because, I, again, it's, it's words on paper. And then how does that actually translate into something meaningful in delivery in the day to day? Um, oh, that's, it's such a good question. What do you, what do you think, Alex? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a really tough question. I mean, I'm increasingly of the mind now, sort of working within a university, that when it comes to can, it, can this work, universities or schools working with communities, in terms of the university, I feel like my role is increasingly to stop the university accessing these spaces. Um, because there is a growing desire to do so, um, I think, as these sort of race equality charters come up, yes. there are more boxes to tick. So they're having, even then, they're being forced to be a bit more creative and stuff. Um, and I do believe there are people that genuinely do want to engage um, meaningfully from the university. But I, as you say, they are quite a, sort of a, um, 
a special space these Saturday schools at least when I think of them in theory I really would be resistant to having the university enter it in the first place if it, if it was to happen then I think it would have to be almost like a drip by drip way like you invite a an academic say that you sort of trust um who has sort of a um a CV as such that shows that they've engaged with these things in a meaningful way in the past and then they sort of get introduced and it's all quite slow and and it's always been considered by the larger group um, of that Saturday school, for example. Mm. Um, how you hold those universities and those academics to account, though, it really depends. It's really difficult because um, normally funding is something that holds people to account, for example. Mm. That's going to be provided by a university if funding's involved. So that, yeah. that tends to hold people to account. I don't think you could use that. Mm. Then it comes down to, like, you suggested recently about an ethical approval yeah. sort of form that we, that would you could hold um people to account with mm. um and there could maybe be certain ramifications that come if you don't uphold um to what you've agreed to mm. um i mean because there's such an imbalance of power what you, what can you really do to an academic if they fail to adhere to that sort of yeah. ethical form i suppose at the very least you could say you're not coming back again um and yeah. they, but but these all feel quite um, lackluster. It is yeah. because of that such a huge power imbalance. Um, so my mind goes more to protecting the Saturday school. To be honest, um, yeah. I can't. I can yeah. think of a few examples, but nothing that really strikes me as being concrete and that I would really like a hundred percent back. Yeah, I think the point that both of you made around drip feeding it and making sure that it's it's in smaller stages. The idea of there needed to be meaningful engagement and consistency. And uh, in, a, in an earlier clip, um, so in the first episode, um, Angina mentioned the idea of commitment. And she said decolonizing is about process, but it's also about commitment. And if organizations actually want to make meaningful change, then they need to demonstrate their commitment in certain ways. And I think that's really helpful to think about in terms of partnership as well. So if a school or if um, a university says that they want to do partnership work with a the community, them saying, in, in addition to doing this work with you, this is our commitment. And that might be regenerating a space, that might mean providing tuition, um, whatever th that commitment is, something that can be written down and have some level of accountability. I've never seen it being done, but it, I, it's a possibility, something that could be tried, I think. Because I think historically, though, those sort of documents, you might both sign them, but they, they can get ripped up by the powers yeah. that be. And that's always, I think, because I think that I think you're right. I think maybe investment from like something like a university, which has infrastructure and money behind mm -hmm. it. So we're going to give you some knowledge and you're going to give maybe some of your research. But in addition, maybe there is a scholarship that could be set up. Maybe there's books yeah. and resources that could be given. Um, I mean, I did recently learn that the university is technically a charity, so can't donate um to other sort of charities or something so yeah. um there's limitations even with that um mm. so yeah so again my concern would be that any document that you might form together yeah uh, no matter how thoroughly it was conceived at the time it could just be ripped up because you, because I, you, there's no real way of it making sure it's it's followed through um yeah so again it's bringing in those people that you you trust um and drip feeding them in i think yeah. and, then, and relying on those people perhaps yeah. And then there's the issue of gatekeeping, because we talk about community and we talk yeah. about it as if it's one big homogenous group that exists outside of institutions. But there isn't one single community and yeah. there isn't like a community leader. So even if there was some sort of accountability, who would be the ones to hold those organizations to account? We don't have a, um, an organizing body that would protect community groups or community spaces. So again, that's an element of power imbalance that's there as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the opportunities for, so we've talked about some of the challenges and some of the obstacles. What do you think are some of the opportunities of uh, partnership working that can happen, that can be led by communities themselves? Really having a good think on that one because mm. I, I, it can be led by the community themselves. I think 
One, one of the things that we're doing, um, and again, it's, it, it doesn't have, I think when you're in this line of work, you're not necessarily going to get your tangible outcomes within like six months. You can't put that kind of time frame on it, which might make it feel sometimes that you're just paying at lip service. Mm. But, but at the same time, I, I feel like, you know, it's important to be doing something. And, and if you're making a mistake, that's fine. Learn from it and then adapt it. So uh, what, 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 what we're trying to do is, is collate the information from individual, like you say, communities are not homogenous. Mm. So co collate information from individual community members. But what we are doing within that is we can see a picture. It's yeah. a pattern that's been repeated in this country for decades. So we look at, um, so what we do is we collate information of the local situation, compare it to the national, and then produce, um, I suppose, what would I call it? Uh, it's, it's almost like a template of, 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 of the impact of our current curriculum on mm. the psyche, self-esteem, um, and even education experience of Black young people, mm. and we're going to MPs. We're going. We're going everywhere with it. Basically, mm. um, we're going to local authorities. We're going into you know in, into council meetings and saying this is what we've been told. This is how it fits with the national picture. These are the things that we suggest that could be done. One thing would be to work with an organisation like ours, which is really grassroots and community based. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how we're beginning, like I say, very early beginning to make some inroads. Um, I've always said in this line of work that when you're talking about sort of structural races and the reality of it, you practically have to write a book. Yeah. Um, have to have so much evidence for people to even take it seriously. But that's the approach that we've taken, mm -hmm. looking at the local, gathering that, seeing the pattern, applying it to the national, and then bringing that, if you like, to your power holders and mm -hmm. saying, this is what we found. And it, it, it is important as well, your delivery, you know, how you explain it to them. You, you, there is expectation that you will use the language that they're used to, that they're comfortable yeah. with. So there is already blockages there, but I'm fortunate that I've worked in a local authority. So I know, yeah. I, I know what needs to happen. So I think it's what it's about as um using you know people like with skills like myself another lady that I work with was a journalist mm -hmm. so she's very good at sort of communication and delivery so we're, we're really tapping into that so it's yeah yeah, yeah. I don't and I think I think your question <laughs> you, you have and I think the key thing that you mentioned is the is again because of the impact of power there is that need to speak in a language that is set by the powers that be and be able to speak in a way that legitimizes what you're saying which is which is really worrying particularly from a community perspective when you think that there's going to be only a handful of people that have also worked in institutions but also are doing meaningful grassroots work within communities that are able to do that work yeah yeah that's so and that's that's gatekeeping again who is allowed a seat at the table who is heard who isn't heard alex what are your thoughts on that yeah, um, I think I think that is, you're right, where the universities and other sort of institutions can come in handy is offering that sort of legitimacy, leverage um, to enact these things. And, and perhaps earlier on when we were talking about the issues that come from when the university or, or whoever else accesses that Saturday school, but maybe taking more of a, um, they don't have to be in that particular space, but they can be using their sort of authority and legitimacy to ensure that there's, I don't know, financial backing for it or that there's resources made available to them or that they help sort of advocate for the development of that programme so that it can appear in more than one space. It can appear in two, three or maybe more. Yeah. Um, I think um, maybe there's more of a role there and, opp and an opportunity there uh, because there is no getting away from the fact that those institutions, they do have much more sway. Um, yeah. If you want to do, I think it's really important to focus on the local and on the local sort of smaller, seemingly smaller successes of having 10 people sat around the room and sharing for an hour um, their experiences, discussing their histories and stuff. Um, I think there's there's so much to be gained from that. And that's a real opportunity that comes from alternative education. Yeah. But, but with that already said, there is also, if you, you want to expand that and give that opportunity to as many people as possible, that then does require an infrastructure. And that's where the universities and institutions can come in and be much more of a help. Um, yeah. 
so I think yeah and for many and yeah and for many grassroots organizations that is where real impact happens Mm -hmm. so you may have an organization that is set up to um, work with schools in partnership or to deliver workshops etc but in order to have meaningful and wide-scale impact they need funding so again it comes down to resources so there is that that need to do partnership working in order for the meaningful work that has been to happen in a grassroots level to actually have wider impact as well yeah although although the funding often gets tied up in also with all sorts of caveats and stuff and yeah. um you end up it's, it's a, it maybe they may be rich and wealthy institutions but actually when it comes down to it again there's some sort of restriction on, on where the money can go and, and how long it takes to get there and um but but be, oh, by that said as well being able to put the name of a big institution on something can also help and give yeah. some, promote help promote something give it a certain legitimacy yeah. So, so sometimes even funding not the main thing. Maybe it's just the, the rubber stamp of a name. Yeah, um, and it and it happens and it happens both ways. There are schools, there are organisations, there are universities that, when they want to tick that diversity box, will engage with community organisations so that they can have that logo or sure. they can say they've collaborated with this particular organisation. So I think there's an element of that working both ways. Maybe it's about you know, communities maybe recognising that. And then thinking, what resources do we actually need and what part of the game can we play ourselves? Exactly. I was going to say that there is um, sometimes there's an expectation, particularly if it's a, a, I don't like the term, but I I will use it just for the sake of of people widely understanding it. Mm -hmm. If it's a BAME led organisation, sometimes there is an expectation from institutions um, that they will work for free and that they will give this knowledge for free. And I've seen that time and time again. Um, and initially, um, going back to, to your point, Alex, is sometimes the, the, the individual is so happy to have had this recognition from, you know, an important institution that they consistently do that. Um, and and they should. I, I really like the idea of, of a kind of partnership where bigger institutions that get more um, money in do give something back, whether whether that be into developing a space like ours or getting resources so that that community group can run more effectively. Because yeah. one of the things that we have to do, because we're, we're, we're grant funded, um, is we're constantly looking at how we can make ourselves sustainable. And that would be one way that really yeah. would be that really would be one way. Taking into account what you're saying about the caveats and yeah. that we don't end up then um, because we're being funded working in the way that they wish us to and only covering yeah. what they wish us to. So there'd yeah. be a lot to think about, but I, I really like that idea of, mm-hmm. of a partnership where, yes, funding and money goes back and makes the community organisation sustainable and mm-hmm. can keep the Saturday school going. Yeah, and I think for me, it's about making sure that the, the organisations that are grassroots organisations have a firm foundation before they engage in partnership working. So knowing what their their core values and their aims and their objectives are like your organization does, Marsha, so that when they are engaging with partners, they're not swayed by yeah. what that funding requires them to do or then they're not pushed in particular directions because there is a there is a, an uneven balance in terms of power. But if you know that your foundation is strong and you've already developed what your core piece of work is at a community level, mm-hmm. then I think there is a level of strength that comes into partnership working because then you know what you're getting from the partner that you're working with yeah yeah so you know I, I mean? definitely and i think there is sometimes um a, a case where individuals get swept up by an institution and then they sort of become the person that you go back to time and time and again yes. so you yeah. can still say i'm engaged with the community but it's, it's perhaps one person um so i mean it's maybe great for them maybe not it depends on their experience but it's not really full comprehensive community engagement but it can be sold as such um mm. and, and that individual has little to no leverage at all and, and they sort of have to go with what the institution tells them to do so mm. so i absolutely agree i think there's much more strength in numbers but also those numbers being organized well-structured um, numbers um mm. and even, especially if you go in as more of like not just one organization but as like a satellite of organizations mm. um and try and you're never going to maybe match the, uh, the the sort of the power of of, of a university, say. But yeah. certainly you can go in with a certain amount of heft, where you 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 sort of lean on the university a bit more. Mm. Um, 
yeah, that, I think that would definitely be helpful. But I suppose I'm always, because I do talk about the university context a lot, I'm always a bit hesitant because maybe that takes away focus from the from more important work that could be done from because you could build these organizations up create sort of a satellite and yeah. then keep it contained within that um because mm-hmm. if you've got all of that growth then I, everything we've yeah. said about the limitations of university partnerships yeah. or other institutions mm-hmm. maybe maybe you know it's, it's building up that network outside of it that's the bigger aim i, I don't know yeah i I'm, i think i'm going to go back to your earlier point around not leaving the universities or not leaving the schools to deliver a particular type of curriculum and mm. then having the Saturday schools deliver a particular type of curriculum because I think this is a really similar comparison I think universities have a responsibility they always have a civic responsibility and they gain a lot of profit from the communities whether that is through the research that they do or whether it's through the student demographic that they take in and so I think separating ourselves from universities in terms of the work that we do, it gives, the, it gives those organizations a get out clause mm. to not have to engage. I do agree with you, Alex, that we need to have some sort of collective yeah. because in terms of accountability, you're stronger together than you are yeah. on your own. Oh, yes. And it's easier to challenge organizations and to challenge institutions when there is a collective of grassroots organizations that have said, we're signing up to the same shared values. Our work might be different, but these are what the things that we have committed to, and we are not going to engage with organizations that do not align with these commitments. I think that sends a really powerful, strong voice that we don't have at the moment. 100% agree. That's um, where, where we're located. We actually have like a really fast growing um, African Caribbean population in particular, partly due to gentrification in in London Mm -hmm. Um, and in a sense I I began thinking we need like a a real power base in this area not just as all I I know many individuals great people in this Mm -hmm. area doing bits of but I I, I started feeling this need we need to pull in um, mainly so for that strength Um, the the unity is is so important and I've also began thinking about other organizations that I can link with across the north the northeast and the northwest mm-hmm. um not to make this about a south north divide mm-hmm. i think it um but because we need that power base so we can say we're working with all of these organizations yeah. so i'll give an example um northern northern police monitoring project i don't personally work with mm-hmm. them but i have been to a few of their talks mm-hmm. they're, they're a very strong organization that they're, they're very strong with regards to explaining what rights you have when it comes yeah. to the criminal justice system to link in and have access to that kind of knowledge is really powerful for them when you're yeah. going to other areas. Yeah. So yeah, that that is really needed. A collective is needed. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, even in terms of partnerships within the collective as well, because I think often when we talk about partnership working, we assume that the other partner is going to be an organisation that is like a university or like a school in order to again legitimise the work that we're doing. And we don't have enough community organizations or grassroots organizations that do partnership working within themselves. So building that up would be something that'd be really important. And in terms of funding, there's more, there are more and more funders now that are offering funding for consortiums or for collective groups that are, are doing it together. So I think there's a lot that we could learn from that. A university, mm-hmm. actually, that's where some somewhere where a university could help because if we're talking about trying to bring these different organizations within a community together and it's not currently happening then if the university facilitated that get together um and that was it literally their role was to facilitate let those conversations happen and then those organizations do what they want with them yeah that would be i mean this would show the commitment of a university as well because there's not they're not really getting anything from that exactly. nothing that they could point to but if they were to support the idea of organizations sort of growing together building and, and doing more effective work, that would be something university could do because they've got buildings, they've got mm-hmm. space. Um, they do have a bit of, you know, you wouldn't have to pay people much to attend those things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that is another area where a university could actually be quite useful. Um, you know, we did something similar recently, didn't we? Yeah, I and I, I completely agree. I think commitment comes down to what are universities and what are schools willing to offer to communities that they're not going to gain from? And I think that really shows the commitment. But I think if a university was to say, so I, 
there was an event that I was organising um, recently that had to be postponed, the BAME Leadership Pipeline thing yeah. that you both know about. Um, and there were organisations that said we would love to sponsor um, because this is something that's really important to us and we're committed to it. And then um, they, fo they followed that up with, but could we include our logo? Could we contribute to the report? Could we include this on our website? And it was how many boxes could we tick from yeah. doing this piece of contribution? And my immediate response was, I can't take your sponsorship. I'm really sorry. And I think that's some of the things that we need to start doing in, in the work that we do at grassroots level is be willing to refuse yeah. sometimes if those commitments aren't upheld or if they don't align with the values that we have. <clears throat> Absolutely. Um, I was um, recently asked to join into a consortium bid to um, to Home Office, mm -hmm. um, and it was about hate crime. The, the funding was around hate crime. What concerned me is that when um, people came to deliver to explain how that that funding worked, mm -hmm. all of the emphasis was on, if you like, um, uh, Islamist terrorist groups. That was all of the emphasis. All of their videos that they had about groups they'd funded was all focused on that. And mm. instantly, that's that's a no-no because it, it can't just be one way. And already, if we accept that funding, we're going to end up going down that line and effectively yeah. stereotyping a group that's already being massively stereotyped um, and and racially disadvantaged. Um, on mm. top of that, so that that is that is a really key thing is learning that it is okay to say no because i think when you're a, a grassroots organization you don't have a lot of money yeah. the temptation is to, to take whatever's offered mm -hmm. um uh, but what would be really so you just saying that there i mm -hmm. completely agree i think it needs to be said more and more and more yeah yeah it's yeah i was just thinking as well um so you said no to that but the next person could say yes to it yes. and they would then benefit from the sponsorship the other organization gets what they want and nothing really changes so i think again yeah. having that having organizations come together as a bigger sort of more satellite organization yeah because then you make those decisions collectively yeah. Um, yeah. and maybe you have this is where you, you talked about earlier about having sort of um a certain principles set out as a, as a yeah. major organization now um where everybody knows that they're not going to take that offer because we're all aligned yeah. to the same principles yes. because you, otherwise you get undermined by the organization next to you mm. um, and, and everyone gets away with it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think that's been the problem for us as, as grassroots organizations for such a long time that we have been so dependent on funding that larger organizations now know that the, the amount of funding seems to be more of a focus for us rather than what that funding is being used to deliver mm. does that does that make sense and then you've got community organizations or grassroots organizations that have taken that funding and now have to evaluate the impact of their work in line with an agenda that they, they had no part in setting yes and it's really problematic because then it positions those grassroots organizations in a really negative light within their own communities yeah yeah so there's, I think there's a lot of work we need to do around what that partnership work internally looks like for us before we even do that partnership work with organisations. Yes, I, I really agree. And the point that you made there, Alex, about um, another organisation will take it, we've experienced that ab absolutely. And um, it, it, it's very disappointing, but it does cause a lot of fractions within, it, you know, it just totally and utterly breaks up the unity. Um, and I think that the, 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 we need to have some real conversations about the importance of unity. We don't have to agree on everything. That's not what unity is. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's about recognizing that, that we have an overarching sort of fundamental base that we all say, this is what we stand for. Yeah. We might take these different approaches. I might say it different to you, but this is what we stand for. And we won't undermine by taking, because um, uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely happened to us locally. And it's really disparaging mm -hmm. because then you see another organization trying to fit in to another, you know, to a, a funder's agenda, and you know it's not going to meet the needs of the community because you're you're dealing with that community and they know it yeah. as well, but they need yeah. the money. So it's it, yeah, it's yeah, it's really important that about how a partnership should work, what is an effective partnership. Um, and it'd be great to have some models of that as well. Mm, <laughs> sure. exactly. Yeah, maybe a shared platform for those. Those case studies to be shared would be really helpful. 
Yeah. I'm just I'm just conscious of the fact that we are almost in time. Do you do either of you have any final reflections that you want to share before we finish off? <laughs> Alex, if you think of something, by all means, go ahead. <laughs> um, I only to sort of um, reinforce the last point that actually I suppose because I, I come from starting my starting point is the university so I'm, my thing is how do I improve partnerships between universities and in organizations in the community but from this conversation I'm thinking actually I agree with you what you said earlier Muna about the organizations within the community maybe need to iron these things out and have the, and, and unite in a more of a formal way before those universities or, or other institutions come in so that we're starting from solid ground from the beginning mm. um, and then you can still again have those those trickle of individuals from institutions coming in in the meantime because that's going to be part of the base that you form yeah but actually maybe more emphasis on on getting those ducks in a row first um, is perhaps something I don't tend to think about straight away because I'm coming from the university perspective and there's an, a need and urgency to sort of figure that out but actually it's maybe helping those other things happen that will be better in the long run yeah yeah Marshall what are your thoughts um I, th I think my final thoughts really would be is, is is around I can't stress it enough but the importance to me of decolonizing the curriculum when I started really looking into this which was you know so many years ago is that if we don't take those steps and it does need to start in well it, it needs to be from primary right up yeah. um but if we don't, we will always consistently reproduce a structurally racist society. There's no way that we can get away from that because we will see it. We will see that teaching a colonized curriculum. We will see it being reproduced in our films, in our media, um, in criminal justice, as we already are. It, it's absolutely fundamental. And I think that, um, like I said, it's doing so me running the Saturday school. As much as I enjoy it and sharing that knowledge, I do know it's going to have a much wider impact even after my time for those young people because they've never heard it before. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of history. They never heard about black brilliance and, and black excellence being spoken about before. It was always the slaves. Um, so they, they're they gonna be able to take that on and make changes themselves, but it does need to reach much wider. So it's mm -hmm. something that we must consistently fight for because we will always have a structurally racist society yeah. as long as we continue with a colonized curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Marsha. Thank you, Alex, for Thank joining you. me. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. It was a brilliant <laughs> conversation. I'll speak to both of you soon. Okay. okay take care. Bye-bye. Take bye. care. Bye.